Welcome to the latest Evershed Sutherland Legal Insights Podcast. Welcome to part two of our EU AI Act Legal Insights Podcast. We continue part two with me, Carolyn Sullivan, a senior associate at Evershed Sutherland in our data protection and cybersecurity team in London. Nils Muller, our partner based in Munich, and Lorna Doggett, our partner in London. In part one, we spoke about what first steps businesses should be taking following the formal adoption of the EU AI Act, looking in particular at Annex 2 and 3 of the AI Act, which decides whether your AI product is considered high risk or not, and what that means in practice, and what information clients are likely to get from AI tool developers to be able to conduct their own risk assessments and provide transparency information as part of their own requirements under the EU AI Act when they are deploying AI themselves. So in this part two, we continue our conversation in more depth about how businesses can start tackling the requirements of the EU AI Act and adding to what steps they can be taking now. Thanks, Carolyn. That's great. And so continuing our conversation and to add to those brilliant steps that lots of our clients are saying they're doing is they are, Mm -hmm. as you described, they're understanding and mapping the AI systems that they are using. They're carrying out the gap analysis. They are establishing a governance framework, organizational structures around, you know, who reports into whom in respect of AI being used in the business, updating and implementing policies, procedures, ensuring that they have compliance between all of the departments within the business. So as I say, I think it's about having a a governance function Mm -hmm. in the same way that we have a data protection officer, um, whether voluntary or or otherwise within a, a business in relation to data privacy now. I think lots of our clients are saying that they are going to try to follow the same kind of governance structure when it comes to um, the use of AI, having somebody at the top who is responsible for it and having people report into that person when they are starting to use the new tools. I think having training programs to empower people in the organisation because we're all trying to get to grips with how Um, AI works in practice and how we can use it in businesses. So I think training programs are really important Mm -hmm. to try and unlock some of the terminology, to try and demystify um, some of the concepts. It's not all about generative AI. And then contract management, that's obviously key. Updating contracts in relation to the tools that are being used. I think As a reminder, just talk about the AI mitigator tool that we have here at Evershed Sutherland, which is essentially an impact assessment. So what you'd get is a concise report for your AI use case. And so this is a report that we'll generate using our specialists across the firm, showing the kind of thematic risks that can be inherent in an AI tool. And then with recommended actions in relation to the risks, we have a RAG rating that comes out of this tool. It's not a particularly complex report you get. It's very easy to use. How does it work? So you'd have an online questionnaire that you fill in on our Collaborate platform. You sign the questions about your AI use case, your AI tool to various people in your business. And then our specialists interact with them in order to glean the information that we need to then produce this RAG rated report. So assuming you're not proposing to use a prohibited AI system or tool, then it would be a report that would talk about some steps that we think are necessary in relation to embedding that AI tool within your business. And it's across things like intellectual property, contracting for AI, data privacy, and various specialists within our firm um, feed into this report. And so I think there's lots of information on our website about this, but we are very willing to do demos about this tool. I think it's an easy way to get a piece of reporting that you can then use to talk with your stakeholders within your business about the AI tool that you want to use. So lots of our clients are saying, what should we do as a first step? Everything just seems too opaque, too complex. We don't know where to start. This kind of an impact assessment, whether it's with our tool or otherwise, is a useful place to start. Yeah. No, I, I think, thanks for picking the AI, AI, AI mitigator up. Indeed, I think that the feedback we got from clients when it came to the use case assessment, what they would like to do with, with AI often came back to the two core themes. One theme was, 
we don't know what questions to ask to the business because I mean, we all know EU AI Act is just a multidisciplinary task. Uh, you mentioned already some like copyright contracting, data privacy. I mean, there's just a lot of subject matter expertise required, plus of course, a lot of technical knowledge. So the AI mitigator basically enables a meaningful outreach to businesses to collect the data that is relevant to assess the use case and basically um, yeah, encourages collaboration rather than ping-ponging on emails with the IT department, with the privacy lawyers, with the compliance department, data governance team. So I think it's a good, good way to have a meaningful outreach and an assessment what steps need to be taken. Like also, Lorna, to pick up on some uh, first steps to take um, and and maybe add a little bit on this. And I think you're completely right. It is complex to 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 some extent. So I think some some initial thinking behind it will, of course, be important for clients to, uh, of course, understand first of all, am I a provider or am I a deployer or maybe both? Because this is really the direction of travel, depending on what you are, different rules will apply to you. So of course, the homework clients have to do will depend on whether they are basically provider of AI. So basically um, simplifying it now, basically someone who really creates the AI system and and, um, and sells it to customers or whether you are the deployer. So someone who basically purchases um, AI systems from a vendor. Um, sector criticality, you mentioned the FFS sector and TMT sector. Uh, so apparently TMT sectors, sector clients will often be the providers of AI systems. So I think the sector itself is critical versus FS sector clients will often be also deployers. And uh, as mentioned earlier on, there is a high sector relevance for the FS sector in terms of credit uh, scoring and, and related activities. So certainly to, to watch out what sector are you and match your sector against the high risk AI use cases in Annex 2 and 3. And you will find, for example, for the life sciences industry, medical devices will be classified to some extent as high-risk AI. So here you already know that you as a medical device manufacturer, for example, need to comply with certain high-risk use cases. Um, so I think that's that's one of the um, initial steps to take to understand, am I provider deployer? Uh, what sector am I operating in? And is my, my use case, my potential use case already classified as high-risk uh, use case? And then you mentioned, Lorna, a very important aspect, understanding the interplay with other rules and, and the data governance behind it is something that is still, I think, a challenge for a lot of companies to understand who is actually responsible for all of this? Is it my privacy department? Um, one can think, yes, it is the privacy department because they could leverage on certain governance models they already put in place when it came to GDPR and there's already a risk framework in place. So I think um, finding the right people, and again, this is not a one person or one department exercise. It needs privacy lawyers or privacy expertise, um, IP expertise. Of course, we need the technical people. And I want to mention, Lorna, one other important topic you brought up, upskilling and educating the people is a very important aspect. And in the AI Act, we have something which is called AI literacy. So it is defined in the EU AI Act, actually, and it basically refers to skills, knowledge, and understanding that allows providers, users, and affected persons to understand their respective rights and obligations in the context of the AI Act. So this is really embedded in the core principle of the EU AI Act to have AI literacy, as we not call it, and how, how it is defined and how it's regulated. And this is actually something that will be sharp six months after the AI Act is um, then basically live and up and running. So when you also ask what are the initial steps to take, clients should consider the staged timeline. And again, um, there is certain uh, rules and obligations that apply at different stages. And the first critical mark is six months. This is where AI literacy and the prohibited practices will apply. So um, the first deadline is really six months to be on the radar. This is where prohibited AI systems will enter into force. Um, they cannot be put on, 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 on the market. And then, of course, AI literacy basically means you need to have a, a program in place to enable and empower your people to understand what AI is, is all about. I just want to mention some other key deadlines in 
combination with the EU AI Act. The first uh, or the second one would be um, nine months. This is where a code of practices will be adopted. Um, so I think everyone is really looking out for guidance. What does it mean to have a, have a risk management system? We talk about, Lorna, later on about how, for example, is the US dealing with AI? And I think there's a lot of things we can we can look um, around the ocean here from the EU and, and look into the US, what they have already established. I just want to buzzword uh, here, the, the NIST framework um, is certainly something which can be considered as something clients can leverage from when it comes to risk management uh, measures. So um, again, there will be also codes of practices from the um, AI office, for example, codes of practices will be adopted. 12 months is another important mark. This is when the rules about uh, general purpose AI, fines, and governance apply. And then basically the, well, let's say one fits all, more or less timeline is 24 months. This is basically uh, when all the rest applies, in particular, the rules about high risk AI rules, at least those mentioned in Annex 3 of the EU AI Act. So the general grace period uh, prescribed by the AI Act is 25, uh, 24 months. But they even, uh, Lorna, there's even deadlines after this date. So um, there's also 36 months uh, for high-risk AI Annex 2 use cases. Don't want to go into all the details here, but uh, you will see it's a staged approach. So, of course, you should start with the elements that kick in at, at an earlier stage. And again, AI literacy is the buzzwords here. Have a training concept for your stakeholders. Thanks so much, Nils and Lorna. There's certainly a lot to think about. So now the EU has made this big step as one of the first to actually regulate our AI, what do you think is next for the UK on, on AI regulation? Thanks, Carolyn. So I think in the UK, we, we still have a principles-based approach. So our government is saying that it wants to kind of come down on the side of being pro-innovation and not overly regulate the use of AI through legislation, but instead to rely on existing regulators adding to their own kind of list of principles in respect of compliance. And so there isn't a rush to regulate here in the UK. We have um, a non-statutory approach at the moment, but there might be a statutory duty coming for all of businesses here in the UK, in both sectors, TMT and FS, to pay due regard to the principles about AI that will be coming from the existing regulators. So by existing regulators, I mean the FCA, the PRA, um, indeed the ICO, various others. But I think the government is looking to empower these existing regulators to police, if you like, the use of AI in their own sectors. So in March 2023, the government published an AI white paper all about this. And we are at the moment waiting to hear from the existing regulators about how they will grapple with the regulation of AI in their own space. We're expecting more clarity about that after the 30th of April. That's the deadline for them to give more information about how they are proposing to regulate AI in their own spaces. And so what we do expect is that there'll still be quite a flexible and proportionate regime from all of these existing regulators so that there can be innovation in the use of AI by firms, banks and, and, and other businesses in the um, TMT and FS sector. So there'll be a focus on safety, security and robustness, transparency and explainability about how AI is used fairness, accountability and governance, and contestability and redress. So these are similar concepts that you'll be familiar with in the EU's new law. And of course, these concepts pervade AI regulation in all parts of the globe. I think one thing to mention is that it's still possible that the UK will, will have some legislation because there is an artificial intelligence regulation bill, a private member's bill, as we call it here in the UK, but it's going through the House of Lords. So it's not proposed by the government, but it's another group of people, if you like, trying to get some regulation on the statute books here in the UK. So very recently, we've had the second reading on that bill. But I think that the extraterritorial reach of the EU law, plus the existing regulators and their own policing of AI, will be the most important thing to focus on at the moment whilst that 
where there's going through the House of Lords to see if it gets anywhere. Yeah. And Lola, maybe one, one thing to add, and that was great listening to basically the UK approach. I think what all the AI principles and regulation and frameworks or whatever you want to call it have in have in common and it's OECD principles. It's AI risk management framework by NIST, the UK government pro innovation approach, executive order, G7. I mean there's so many basically out in the world currently in terms of how we push or how the countries position themselves in terms of AI. What is imminent to all of the approaches is it's about responsibility accountability, robustness, security and safety, transparency, human centric. So these are all embedded in each of the um, frameworks I've just mentioned. So even again, if if, if you're not uh, caught, caught by the extraterritorial reach of the UAI Act, the principles you just called out and, and I called out are certainly something we see in the world in, in most of the countries. That's great. Thank you, Nils. Thank you both. And Speaking of the EU and the UK, if we take a look at the US and think about any changes expected there for AI as well. Thanks, Caroline. I think in the US, there isn't any sign yet of a comprehensive federal bill on AI regulation. There's been lots of chatter about that, but nothing as yet. There are lots of proposals at the state level and further act Activities is definitely expected at a state level throughout 2024. On our global website, we've got an AI preparedness checklist for our clients with US operations. So there'll be a link to that from wherever you access this podcast. But I think a reminder that, for example, in New York City, in Colorado, there are particular regulations that are relevant, for instance, in the insurance sector, Colorado, in New York, it's about employment, use of AI in the employment sphere. So I think it's it's an, an approach that differs depending on the state in which you're operating. But as I say, I think that the AI preparedness checklist will be um, helpful. And that is available from where you access this podcast. Thank you so much, uh, Nils and Lorna. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. We regularly publish thought leadership, so please log on to eversheds-sutherland.com to read this. And thank you and look out for our next episode in a few weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Eversheds Sutherland Legal Insights Podcast. 